Amen. And uh, well, I appreciate that song. Uh, that's one that you could sing as a worship song. <laughs> Amen. Isn't that a blessing? Let's take our Bibles and turn to the book of Revelation. That should be easy to find. It's the last book in the Bible. So Revelation chapter number 13. Revelation chapter number 13. I want to draw your attention to verse 11. We'll start reading in verse 11 and share with you a message. The global currency control. The global currency control. Revelation 13 verse 11. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them that dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as, as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he calls us all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save or accept he that, that he had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Herein, here is wisdom, let him that hath understanding Count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred three score and six, or six, six, six. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for this Lord's Day, and we thank you for the word of you, our living God. We thank you, Father, that you know the beginning from the end. Lord, you reveal things before they even uh, take place in, in, in accurate detail, God, so that we would know that Thou art God alone, and beside Thee there is none other. Lord, I thank You for helping us to see what's going on in the world today is what You've declared would happen in Your Word. I pray, Father, for those that may be in this service that have not received Christ as their Savior, Lord, and they're not uh, at all earnest about that. Or they're just going through life without concern, a concern for their soul. I pray, God, that you would stir them and awaken them. Lord, open their blinded eyes that they may see the desperate need that they're in. Lord, cause them to fear the judgment of God. And Lord, help them to see that one day... If they die in their sins, they'll be cast into the lake of fire to spend eternity there. Father, I ask you also that you'd be with the saints. We are approaching your uh, soon return. It's imminent. And I pray, Father, that we would not grow lazy in these days, but, Lord, that we would watch and pray and that we would, we would be busy about your work and your kingdom. Lord, stir the heart of every true believer, that they might live more for Christ than they ever have before because of the Word of God. And Lord, help me. I, Lord, I need you. I can't do anything without you. And Lord, I pray this uh, message would benefit your kingdom and would glorify your Son, for it's in Jesus' name we pray and ask these things. Amen. The book of Revelation, along with some of the other books in the Bible, tell us what we can expect in the last days. 
Many have scoffed at the Bible prophecies only to be stunned by how accurate God is. In 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 3 through 6, we read these words about the mindset of men during the days when Christ will return. It says, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, mockers, walking after their own lust, and saying, where is the promise of His coming? Have you heard anybody say that lately? For since the fathers fell asleep or died, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. At least they acknowledge creation. Amen. Amen. That means uh, atheism will fall off the radar pretty soon. <laughs> For this they willingly are ignorant of that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. The evidence of a worldwide flood is everywhere. I mean, it's evident. The fossil records themselves testify to a worldwide flood. Not a local flood, but a flood that covered the earth. If you have to close your eyes and use a great imagination not to see the record that God has left and use that imagination to come up with something as silly as the theory of evolution. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 4-6, through 6, Paul says, though to believers, we're not like the scoffing community. We're not the mockers. We're those who are trusting in the living God. So when the approaching of Christ is nearer, we should be anticipating that. We should be looking at what's going on in the world and we should be excited, not thrilled with the downward course of morality and sinfulness, but excited about the fulfillment of prophecy and the announcement of the coming of the Son of God. Paul said this in 1 Thessalonians 5, 4 through 6, But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. Therefore, therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. When you see what's going on in the world it should draw you to a more watchful spiritual state. Some of the signs of the coming of Christ the church has seen throughout the book of Revelation, also here before us in Revelation chapter 13. We're introduced to two beasts. The first we did not read of, but the first is the Antichrist, and the world will worship this Antichrist. The second beast that we read of is the false prophet. And the false prophet and the Antichrist are signs of the coming of Jesus into the world. Remember Paul said that his approach is near. That is the man of sin or the son of, the son of perdition. So we see even in this text before us there is a global government, right? All the world is going to be following after this Antichrist and the false prophet. So we see also a global religion, right? They're all going to be worshiping him. They're not going to be worshiping a diversity of false religions. They'll be worshiping this Antichrist. It'll be a global Religion, and we also see a global currency control. He said no man can buy or sell except that he gets in line and accepts the mark of the beast. And if you'll read Revelation chapter 13, you'll see also the global persecution of those who have put their faith in Christ during that tribulation period. So the Antichrist will rule during the great tribulation days. 
The majority of the world will follow after him because he will fool them. He will deceive them. He'll be able to do amazing things. Now, uh, I know that the church world itself is trying to encourage people to look for signs, look for something supernatural, something unusual, (laughs) magnificent. Let me say something to you. They're only being prepared for the coming of the Antichrist. We are taught in the Word of God to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, to trust Him. A wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. Amen? I hope that you're not looking for a sign. God has already proven Himself to be true and to be the true God. Amen? And and by the way, He settled that forever on resurrection morning. Amen. Jesus is alive. Praise the Lord. And so don't be looking for a sign, but the Antichrist will feed into that. Did you, did you hear what we read in verse 13? He is going to make fire come down from heaven. That, that would be a mighty miracle, right? What was the test of the true God in the Old Testament? Fire coming down from heaven. Don't you think he's going to use that Old Testament verse to say, if you want to know if I'm a true God... Watch what I'm able to do. And by the way, this will not be sleight of hand. This will not be like magicians who are just uh, deceiving your natural eye. The Bible makes it clear these will be real miracles. Look at verse 14. And deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beings. These will be astonishing miracles so that when men look at those things, they will believe this has to be God. This has to be the Creator. This has to be the one that we've been looking for, and so He'll fool the majority of the people that live on the earth. But if He cannot fool them, He'll force them. He'll force them. There's something unique about Christianity Christianity is not spread by the sword. You can't convert people to Christ at the end of a gun barrel. Amen? They may say the words, but the only thing that can change someone's heart is genuine, true belief. Not forced conversion, but true, willful conversion. Amen? But the beast and the, and the devil... They have no qualms about forcing their religion on others. So, we see here in Revelation chapter 13, the world has been conditioned to accept the mark of the beast. Did you hear that? The world has been conditioned to accept the mark of the beast. Sometimes you wonder, what is going on in the world? Do you wonder that? And when I look at what's going on in the world, I see things lining up just like the Bible said that they would. The mark is announced, the mark of the beast is announced here in Revelation chapter 13. It says if you embrace this mark, that's that's the rejection of Christ. That means your eternal destiny will be hell fire. Yet, there are droves that are lining up to get this mark on that day. Even though it's announced plainly for us in the Word of God. How how could that happen? One of the reasons that can happen is because most of the people living today have no knowledge of the Bible whatsoever. A lot of people attending church are ignorant of what the Bible teaches. And the world itself has no real knowledge of what the Bible says about these subjects. In fact, the world has an animosity and hatred for the Scriptures. And because they don't know what the Bible teaches, many will willingly accept the mark of the beast, especially since they're already been conditioned to do so. You say, how is that going to happen, preacher? What will will bring it to pass? Well, I think we have an example in Genesis chapter 47... This is going to be during the Great Tribulation period. That means uh, every island will be moved. All the mountains will fall flat. This is, it'll be catastrophe 
all across the globe. Famine and pestilence will be everywhere. Could you imagine living during that time? And so in Genesis 47, we get the story of Joseph when he was in Egypt under Pharaoh's rule. Remember, Pharaoh had a dream, and he dreamed uh, uh, that uh, seven fat cows would be consumed by seven lean cows, and then seven ears of corn would be consumed by seven blasted, ill-favored ears of corn. And he was confused by that dream and didn't know what was going to happen. And Joseph, by God, was able to interpret that dream, and he said, Pharaoh, this is the interpretation. There are coming seven years of plenty. But at the seven years of end of that period, there's going to come seven years of, fa- of famine throughout all the land, insomuch that all the seven years of plenty will be consumed in the seven years of famine. If you'll read Genesis 47, you'll find out when the fa- famine began to strike even the people of Egypt, they went to Joseph and said, Look, we can't feed our family. There's no resources here. And Joseph said, Well sell your cattle and your mules and all that you have and we'll give you corn. And so they sold all their possessions just so they could have something to put on the table and eat. But the next year they came back to Joseph and said, Joseph, we don't own anything. But we're desperate for food. We have to have something to eat. And then he said, well, sell yourself and your land And if you'll sell yourself to Pharaoh and your land, then we'll give you corn to eat. And guess what they did? They sold themselves and their land to Pharaoh. They said, what good is the land going to do us if we just die here? I'd rather be a slave and have food on my table than die being a free man. That's pretty much what they were saying, right? Well, guess what? That'll be the mindset during the reign of the Antichrist as well. He's either going to force you to accept him or he's going to fool you into accepting him. Now, consider this. 200 years ago, 90%, 90% of the United States population lived on farms and they produced their own food to eat. 90% lived on farms and they produce their own food to eat. Today, less than 2% of the world population feed 7 billion people. Less than 2% of the world's population feed 7 billion people. Could you imagine the scarcity of food during the reign of the Antichrist? If you ask most people where does chicken meat come from, they'll say Walmart. Right? If you were to take them to a farm and then if they saw what it took to get that chicken meat, a lot of them would just pass out. They'd be shocked. What? You're doing that to a chicken? Brenda said one day they had a chicken killing at their home and there was a young man that was dating her oldest sister, Connie, and so they boiled, got the feathers off, singed the chickens, got the hair off, and Miss Whitehead cooked some for dinner. And they were sitting around the table. The young man went to take a bite of the chicken and one of the boys said, Needless to say, he didn't eat any chicken. (laughs) Isn't that sad? Most people don't even know where their food comes from. You're fooling yourself if you think you're always going to be able to go to Walmart or wherever and just get your food. There's going to come a day that you're not going to be able to do that. You say, preacher, I would never, ever accept the mark of the beast. What if you had a child that was starving to death. According to the most recent data from U.S. Census Bureau, almost 153 million out of 309 million Americans depend on the federal government for food stamps, Social Security, housing, and even Medicare. They are absolutely, they're holding their hand out every month hoping 
that the check comes in and the resources come in so they can continue to exist. Get that? Almost half of the people living in America are already hand to hand, mouth to mouth, depending on the federal government. It's changed drastically. In 1983, that was only 29%. You see, it's not a good thing when our nation continues to get more and more and more people on the government payroll. Lately, one party, and I'm not making this into a political speech, but one party has unashamedly embraced socialism. You ever thought there would be a day in America that Americans would be considering, and a large number or percentage of Americans would be considering socialism as a good thing? Socialism doesn't mean that you get everything for free. That's not what it means. Always remember this. Everything costs something. It costs someone something. Nothing is for free. If you believe that it, it is for free, you're fooling yourself. Socialism means this. You lose your freedom and the government takes over your life. Amen? So we've abandoned God for government. We trust in the government instead of trusting in God. We foolishly think that the government can fix our problems. Now listen to me. That's what I would call insanity. Right? Amen. We think that. But let me ask you something. Name one problem that they fixed. Right? There's been a war on poverty for I don't know how long now. And we haven't won that war. It's gotten worse. Right? Name one thing they fixed. They tamper with our educational system all the time. Instead of teaching our children how to read and write and do simple math, now they're taking school as a social project. Teach them to read. Teach them to write. Teach them math. That's what will benefit them. That's what will help them to be free. Amen? Amen? So we're being conditioned. All these things happening in the world are setting you up for that day that the Antichrist will begin to rule. In fact, there's already currently systems in place. Right now, those systems are already... There'll not have to be a great change in society for the Antichrist to implement his systems. Are you aware of that? Years ago, preachers, years ago, preachers preached against Social Security and getting a Social Security number. How many are aware of that? I mean, they said Social Security number is a mark of the beast. Now, your Social Security number wasn't a mark of the beast, no. But it's certainly a system that will make the mark of the beast a whole lot easier, Right? Now just think about that. I'm not, I'm not uh, a 1900s preacher and preaching, you know, crazy things. Just think about that. It's a system already set up. Social Security number was first issued in 1935. In fact, I was I was a, one of the first ones to get my Social Security number zero 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 one. I'm, I'm not. I'm not serious. I'm joking there. But <laughs> in case you can't tell, <laughs> I better clarify that. But within three months, 25 million numbers were issued. It's not the mark of the beast, like I said, but it's certainly a system that could be used. Right? What if they wanted to identify all the people that lived in America? What if they said, listen, that's a national security issue. Doesn't that make common sense? We've got we to at least know who's within our borders. So they mandate either going to the Social Security office personally and getting your number or getting your number reissued. And if you don't have that number, 
then you will not get any medical attention and so on and so forth. That could be so easily mandated, right? I'm saying the system is already there. We've already become largely a cashless system, right? Isn't that true? Now, I'm, I'm really not that old. But I do remember a time where if we were going to do something, we used actual money. <laughs> And I thought it was just amazing that you could go to a to get gas and you could put your card in and slip it out without ever having to go inside and you could pump your gas and you didn't you didn't ever have to talk to anybody. I thought that is so amazing. It is amazing, isn't it? How many of you write checks to pay your all your bills with? Right. There's a few people that still write checks to pay all their bills with, but most people have they write just a few checks. Some write uh, checks for ties, and that's that's the only check they ever write. How many of you use direct deposit from where you work at? You work there, you don't ever see a penny; it just goes right in the bank. I always like to get my check and get it cashed. And have the cash in hand. I don't know what I like about that, but I always like that. Of course, one company I work with, the checks bounce, so that was of necessity. <laughs> How many of you use the self checkout at the grocery store? I don't like that. I tell you what, I especially don't like. I don't like going to Lowe's or Home Depot. Look in that big store for what I need, and then coming up to check out, and they say, "Go use the self checkout line." Like, Why are you even here then? And by the way, I think that's how it's going to get. There'll be no human interaction. You'll just go to the store and put in what you want, and and then you'll leave, and you'll never have to talk to anybody. That's not good, by the way. See, I wonder. There's only a few people I know that handle everything they handle in cash. Most people use a debit card, and a lot of times all you need is a simple code, right? So I'm saying we're just a step away from, instead of having it in your hand, to having it on your hand. The BBC reported of a high-tech office complex in Sweden that's using chips in the hands of people this is the quote from that BBC article. It said, um, you want to gain entry to your office? Get on a bus? Or perhaps buy a sandwich? Where? where We're all getting used to swiping a car to do all these things. But at an epicenter, a new high-tech office block in Sweden, they are trying a different approach, a chip, under the skin. Or how about Three Square Marketing and Wisconsin Company? In July, they were one of the first companies in America, July 2017. They began offering implant chips to their employees. Employees who have a rice grain size RFID chip implanted between their thumb and forefinger can then use it to make purchases in the break room micro market, open doors, log into computers, or use the copying machine. CEO Todd Weslio said eventually this technology will become standardized, only allowing you to use this as your passport, public transit all purchasing opportunities, etc. You say, well, preacher, we're, we're way away from the market. At least, no, we're not. They already have little systems that they're working on that will require you to use these systems if you're going to buy or sell. In North Carolina, all poultry owners, large and small, must register register for an ID number, a farm ID number. You get that all poultry, chicken, turkey, etc. 
They have to register their farm, large or small. That means if you just have a few chickens, maybe a, a couple and a rooster, you still have to register and get a farm ID number just to have those animals on your farm. They were considering a bill like that in Florida where you had to, you had to report every farm animal that you had. Now, why do they need to know every farm animal you have? Well, in order for them to control who's going to eat and when they're going to eat, they have to know where all the resources are. Amen? Is there anyone here that hunts? Oh, I was hoping there's a lot of hands that go up. Just a few there on the back. Florida Wildlife Management passed new rules for this hunting season. The new rules require all hunters to report the deer they harvest. Harvest is just a nicer word for saying shot and killed. <laughs> New rules require all hunters to report the deer that they harvest. Why do they need to know? I mean, they have they set a limit five. You can only kill five deer. I don't know any hunters that kill much more than that. To be honest with you. Do you know any hunters that kill more than five? No. Why do they want you reporting every deer? And if you don't do that, guess what? You're breaking the law. Why would they pass a law like this? They even want to know what you're taking out of the woods and wild game. You say, preacher, why is that important? Because there's a purpose behind everything. Amen? Amen. It'll get to a place where you have to report everything that's butchered and give an account for the meat itself. The truth is, if they could have banned guns a long time ago, they would have already done that. Amen? Amen? Now, I'm like you. I hate to see innocent lives taken. But if it weren't for the Second Amendment in our Constitution, they had already confiscated our guns. They banned guns in Great Britain. And knife crimes, knife crimes have soared to the point that they're thinking about banning knives. Well, think about that. You're not going to be able to control the evil of man. The only one that can help is Jesus. He is the only one that has the answer to our sin problems. He's the only one that can change the heart. He's the only one that can take us from loving ourselves to loving God and loving others. He's the only one that can do that. Amen. Government will never be able to accomplish that. So the systems are already there, right? They've been conditioning you to accept that. So what is your choice? What is it that you and I can do about that? Well, I would say, first of all, receive Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Amen. If you're not a Christian, I pray that the Spirit of God would draw you to Jesus Christ and that you would make sure that you have a real relationship with Him before the end of this service or the end of this day. Amen. Trust Christ. You say, preacher, why is that? Because I believe that the church will be raptured before the great tribulation. I believe that, and I hope I'm true. I mean, I hope I'm right. I hope I'm right. <laughs> there are some passages that give me a little bit of concern. One, it said, pray that you may be counted worthy to escape these things. <laughs> uh, by the way, I do pray that prayer. <laughs> But that gives me pause. What if carnal Christians are left behind? What if some of those parables that are confusing, like Matthew 25 when he says, he'll appoint them their portion with the hypocrites. What if that is he's, 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 he's warning us, listen, if you want to live like the world, you might as well suffer like the world. 
I, I don't believe that's true. I hope it's not true. But I say, if you want to avoid this, this that, that choice of watching a baby starve to death, now I, I imagine most, most parents would say something like this, if it means me going to hell, preacher, I'm not going to let my baby starve to death. I mean, most people would r rationalize that. They would reason it out just that way, wouldn't they? Now, that's not good reasoning. But most of us would almost feel compelled to do that. Have you ever watched a sick child and prayed this prayer? God put their sickness on me and, and, and give them the, the measure of help. But I'll bear that sickness. That's a hard thing to watch a loved one suffer. Amen? And so trust Jesus. Come to Jesus before it's eternally too late. And if you're those, one of those that were left behind, I would say to you, reject, reject the mark of the beast. I know some people think, preacher, I, I, I certainly would reject the mark of the beast, but you will be considered lawless, a criminal. If you read the book of Revelation, you'll be persecuted. You will be killed. It's not going to be an easy thing for you to be a follower of Christ during the great tribulation period. In fact, it says they'll have their heads cut off because they refuse to accept the mark of the beast. By the way, that's the best choice. You say, preacher, the best choice to lay your life down? Yes, compared to eternity, separated from God? I'd rather starve to death or be shot or have my head severed, amen, than to spend eternity in hell. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 28, the Bible says this, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. Amen? Fear not them which are able to kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. If you will not receive Jesus today, let me warn you, most likely you will receive the mark of the beast in that day. I think we always think that we're going to do something different or something better. We always think, well, I, I would never do that. And a lot of times we find ourselves doing that, right? I had a brother, he's not quite a year older than I am, and for the longest time he said, what I'm going to do is I'm just not going to accept the mark of the beast. And that way I'll know I'm going to get heaven. I said, Rodney, there's two problems with that. One, you may die before then. How many know when Jesus is coming back, the day or the hour? None of us know, right? And you say, preacher, well, I'll just wait, and I just won't accept the mark of the beast. You may not see the sun rise in the morning. If you die in that state, you're going to be separated from him forever. Right? That's an unwise thing to do. But if you won't bow a knee and receive Christ in this day of grace, when the Spirit of God is drawing you, what makes you think without the aid of the Spirit and in that day of great calamity where men are crying out for rocks to fall on them and hide them, that you're going to say repeatedly, no, I'm not going to accept that mark. There are going to be many that will be forced to convert to the Antichrist. Amen? Amen? Now, when you watch what's going on in the world, I hope that you, like me, will see everything Jesus said is coming to pass just like he said it would. Amen? Amen. Uh, when we look at uh, even America being in such great debt, I think we're like almost $23 trillion in debt. If we, the citizens, were to pay off that debt, every one of us would have to pony up $69,000. And you say, why are people working so hard to make America weak? Because America is one of those forces that's keeping the world back from just being a totally dominated. 
When America falls, it'll be easy to get everybody else in line. Amen? And don't, you, don't, don't deceive yourself in thinking that some people are not working really hard to see that we are just as weak as other nations are, so we'll have a global community, a global economy. Amen? By the way, it's going to happen. But just because it ha- it's going to happen don't mean we shouldn't fight it tooth and nail. Amen? <laughs> Uh, it's going to happen. God said it would. But I'm going to fight just as long as I can. Amen? Amen? Antichrist is coming. The false prophet will be here. There will be signs and wonders that will be so amazing. People say, wow, that has to be deity. It has to be God. You would have thought they would have believed that way when Christ was here, wouldn't you? <laughs> but somehow they were blinded to that truth. But men will accept the Antichrist rejecting Jesus. Where will you stand? I hope that we'll be raptured at home and in heaven. Amen? But you have to know Christ in order for that to be true. If you're not saved, come to Him. I promise you, you don't want to be here during those days. Amen? Let's stand for prayer. Father, help us.